Thank you guys for coming for this talk. So today we're gonna learn something about talks mainly, but uh, before I learn it, it's actually a tool which has the bold aim to actually standardize testing inside Python. Uh, and we already have tests, you may say. Everyone heard about PyTest, but if you like load up the one of the GitHub repositories, for example, for the PyTest tools based itself, you see that but down there, there is a tux.ini file, meaning it PyTest itself uses tux. Or you can go it pip similarly does that, or there are other tools such as, for example, request also does similar user stuff. So if you come and start want to contribute to this project, you might get the question, so why is this talks all around and what actually this purpose is. Hopefully by the end of this session you will have a good understanding of what talks tries to do, why it's needed, and what can it do for you, how can you use it, how it works. Okay, so let's start with the first question, why it is needed. Uh, yeah, uh, just to brighten up the mood ever so often, I put in a few bugs here and there, so that's for that. Okay, so let's start with like, uh, generally you have uh, your Python application, what kind of uh, parts uh, Python application nowadays has? So first and foremost, you have your business logic. This basically boils down to your actual source files. This is what your manager writes for you to actually, or pays for you to do. Okay, then we have the tests, which are basically for yourself, so you can actually ensure that whatever your manager asks is actually doing whatever you wrote. Uh, then you have some packaging, because usually whenever you create an application or even like a library, you actually want to package it and deploy it to the where it will run or to the other users. So you need to have packaging. Then you need to also have documentation, because someone else when it comes back still need to understand the project. Then you have nowadays also quite popular type checks. For example, MyPy try to actually check if anything's okay or not in your source code. And then you have also like static code analysis. This is think of tools such as Flake or Pep8 or uh, PyLint. And finally, usually when, if you, especially if you're writing a library, this is true, you want to support that library for more than one Python versions so that everyone can be happy and start using it. Uh, and therefore, you actually want to test that you, whatever you're creating works under multiple Python softwares. And then there's another, another dimension, which is most used, for example, the Django world, where you have multiple versions of Django. So if you write a Django plugin, you want to ensure that it runs with all types of Django versions. Okay? So these are basically complications, which means that instead, of, like beforehand, you maybe had to write one test. Now you're that one test instead now you have like basically 10 tests or 12 tests or similar, a lot more tests which you want to basically run. And for an additional thing which is usually nice whenever someone comes to your project and they want to like quickly get started with the project, they don't want to read two pages of how to get started developing. They usually would be nice if they can just have a single comment which they can use to actually set up the entire developer environment so to say. And obviously you want to ensure that all these kind of configurations and all these kind of steps and all these kind of checks in your application actually pass after each commit. So the next people who come and start contributing something to your project, it actually can start with a clean slate and doesn't have to first repair whatever is broken in the project. Luckily we live inside a great ecosystem of Python. This means that we have a lot of people who are eager to open source their solutions for various solutions, for various problems. And what this means that, for example, we obviously have a tool for everything. For tests, we have PyTest, Nodes test, for packaging, nowadays it's quite, a, for libraries there is set up tools flipped or poetry, but for applications like Pax or Ser or things which are nowadays quite popular, or the documentations, both things and make docs is widely used inside the Python ecosystem. Uh, as I said before, and the static analysis style checks like Black, Pilot, Flint also make it. Then we have all the ways we can create partial uh, virtual environments, which basically help you test multiple Python versions. And then you also have, you can use this also to test the virtual dependency types. For example, you want to test again Django 1 and Django 2 in the same time. Okay. So now basically you can set up for your project, uh, use one of these tools and make sure, and you use one of these tools and basically once you use that tool, everyone can ensure after every commit that everything runs, okay? But the downside is that now basically you introduce to your project 10 tools and everyone who wants to basically just maybe contribute even a little might need to actually learn all those 10 tools and understand how they need to be used to actually be able to work with the project. 
Okay? So, this is not really a good place to be because basically now you mean that whoever comes to your project, you will have a really steep learning curve to actually join the project and actually understand why all these, why all these tests are needed. And meaning basically you will have some really sad users when they want to contribute to the project because they will not actually understand why something, for example, might fail, some checks might fail in the CI for which he locally did not fail. For example, a stat, uh, quite common example is that, for example, he messes up the formatting or some static checking, and even to locally test passed, it will still mean that the CI will broke on the remote, and this generally leaves contributors needing to come back all the time to whatever they started to create. So, uh, the idea would be that it would be nice if we could somehow bring down the bridge or build the bridge between the CI and the local development environment, and somehow it could basically be possible to run the same thing that we run the CI, run also locally. Okay, so as I said beforehand, it, GitHub uh, advertises creating the contributing file, which basically means someone has to read it and understand it and then actually use it. Then you have the option you may probably at one point you will get fed up with copying around comments, so you will start writing shell scripts to actually inter contain all this kind of test. Or if you're really hardcore, you go and write a make file, which basically does the same, it's more like an advanced shell script. Okay, so here's just a good example how one of these shell scripts could look. So you basically, you want to basically start with just checking that if anything fails, stop, don't continue, and then basically start uh, packaging your project, installing it, creating a virtual environment, running your test, and if everything, once all these comments are run, you probably, everything will also pass on the CI side. Okay, now, as I said beforehand, this, uh, in this example, it's only for one Python, which is like a system Python. It would be nice to add virtual environments, because what if you need to support both for Python 3.7 and 3.6? So also, you want to run all checks regardless and actually print maybe at the end of the report, because the profile here I did not end I did not actually address the point of maybe it would be nice in the end we would print out all the things which failed and because that's what the usual actually will need to ad address. And it would also be nice if we could actually run this in parallel. Because basically many of these tools can run in parallel because they're not depending on each other. Okay. So as far as going to actually testing multiple Pythons, you can use the virtual env or the vm, which is added to Python core libraries. And basically, you can create your own lightweight site directory and then keep installing your package into it. We, this you can use basically by activating, but you don't have to actually activate it. If you really want, you can, and you can spell out the full path, you can use the full path to actually run things inside a given virtual environment. Okay, obviously this now requires you to actually remember what is the path for your virtual environment. Or this basically, once we add this just for one virtual environment, this kind of our bash script now becomes this 10 lines, which makes only still does not actually do any reporting when also just handles one single Python version, so you probably want more than that. So one can see that at this point that this kind of writing, this kind of magic scripts which run every test, basically, every kind of tools starts to be hard to actually maintain. It also looks error prone, because if you can do anywhere and type of the error, if you want to add another environment, it's like you have to type a lot of other, it probably will incorporate a lot of copying around. So this sort of seems like there must be a better way with this. And what we want is happy users. We want them to be jumping around in our project. So let's try to do something like that. And this is uh, the Tuxus dream. Uh, Tux was actually started out by the same developers who started out PyTest. They envisioned the testing, the test runner more or less to be Tux and PyTest to be actually the test frame, the testing framework. But you can, they, Vision talks to be the tool which actually drives, which people start interacting with. Okay, so how can we achieve merging the CI and shell-based testing, okay? So the idea is that we should be able to run locally everything which we run on the CI. This is all especially important because in anything breaks on the CI, you want to be able to reproduce it locally because that's how you, that's where you can actually, for example, start debugging it and actually understand what's happening, okay? so. 
Tox is basically allows for a Python project to define all tools in one place, meaning that all kind of tools that you may use, you may add checks for it. You can define it in one single configuration file with their actual configurations. Uh, furthermore, you also have a central way of invoking them. When we talk about central way of invoking them, think of it like make targets. That's probably the best approximation, or generally just build targets. And finally, you should be ensuring, should be creating an environment which is isolated and reproducible, so to say. So when you run then it should be. And by isolation, we don't just necessarily mean virtual environment. We also mean, for example, uh, shielding you from whatever you have in your user operating system environment, okay? So, it is basically a CLI tool, meaning if you actually, to actually use Tux, Tux, you don't need anything, you just need Python pip, and then just install it. And then you can invoke it with, for example, Python minus and Tux, and that the user should, should work it and should be able to run all the testing without actually remembering what are the comments, okay? And it basically manages, creates, and runs a reproducible environment. So this is what Tux actually does for you. It basically will ensure it has a, has a look at your configuration. It will try to recreate your old, your recreate a testing environment for a given target exactly as you defined it. Okay, so let's see how it actually works. This is like a flow diagram which shows what Tux actually does. It initially has like a simple configuration phase. So this is basically just putting together everything you have in your configuration file and whatever you pass in from the command line plus whatever may be inside the operating system environment. Then there is thus, uh, some of the steps are optional, so you don't have to do all the tabs. For example, the packaging is an optional. If you have a library, you also want to, for example, package your library, because when you want to test it, you actually want to test the package version, whatever the end user would use, not what your local file system contains, okay? And, but as I say, this is basically packaging, so you can also use it for your applications. So once the packaging is done, it will, for each of your targets, it will define a virtual environment. And this virtual environment will phase over three phases. It will have an environment creation, uh, an install phase, and finally it will have a run comment phase. And once all the comments have run, it will have a reporting, okay? So this is, for example, a simple configuration. I'm not sure how good it is, so I'm gonna try to zoom in. Maybe shows a bit better. So for example, here is a simple project. I defined uh, three environments. For example, one of my environments is basically just running the test under Python 2.7, for example, here. And then I have a linting, a documenting, and a publishing target also. This target, for example, the linting, because you use a file in 2.0 requires Python 3 plus, so I specified it like Python 3.7. My documentation does the same, because maybe inside my confpy I actually want to use the fancy app strings and all that things. So it is possible to specify that for the documentation use a different Python environment or a different version. And then I also defined in the end uh, publishing. For example, I don't have to actually remember how to publish everything. I just defined there that for me, publish basically means have an environment which has both setup tools and twine, and then just basically run the setup by as this this wheel, and then use twine to actually publish it. Okay, so this means that now basically whenever I need to do publish, I don't have to anymore remember whatever. I just call the publish target, and it will work, and it will create for me and make sure that I have the correct twine versions and that kind of things. Okay. Uh, the first thing which I have there in like the first time when I see Amblist, that is basically the Amblist which will run always. So if the user doesn't specify what should run, it will run those environments in that order, more or less. Uh, but as I can see, things which I don't need to run always, I can define it as an additional one, and they are for me to be run as on demand. For example, the publishing is something we probably don't want to do it after every commit. So that's something that is not actually defined inside the default environment, so to say, which are run by default. Okay? So, yeah. As you can see, each of them are like separately defined. They have their own section where you can define not just the dependencies, you can also define their actual arguments that you want to pass on to those kind of configurations. And this allows you, for example, you can now have all your configuration in one file because most of the tools provide command line environment flex and you don't no longer necessarily need to have custom configuration files laying around like 
five, four in your project for each different kind of project. Okay. For example, this will be the actual documentation building, and you can see it even generates a unique build directory for it. Where the user can actually then see the output if they want to see it. And yeah, now let me zoom back. Okay, so. Let's go to the next one, the packaging. So the packaging is basically, it creates an installable package. This is the only that when you have a library. Uh, the build dependencies at the moment are not actually insured, meaning that from wherever the environment you're actually invoking to needs to have all the build dependencies. Now this is a temporary thing, because long, I wrote here long term, but probably it's more like in three months or so. The plan is that once PIP will have uh, PEP 517 and 518 support, we will actually be able to specify our project or build dependencies inside those files. And we'll be able to actually ensure also that you can actually install, like PIP will ensure that you have all your build dependencies. Like build dependencies are, for example, the setup tools that you want to use, but also like additional ones which are actually actually doing the build but are required to do the build, for example, setup tools SCM is one of the popular which you can use to like automatically version your project. This is also like a build dependently, but it's not actually a build tool. Okay. So the next step, environment creation. Uh, it basically wants to be optimized, meaning that if the environment already exists, you already run the command beforehand. It will not recreate it from scratch. It will reuse it. Uh, now, as I, as you can remember beforehand, like here, I had here at the start the section where I defined what kind of Python I want. So this means that there must be a way somehow the application or the tool needs to figure out what Pythons do you have on your computer and what actual interpreter where it lives. So for this one, we actually use the system path on Linux. So basically, we try to see if there is a Python 3.7 executable in your system. Okay. Uh, obviously, this doesn't work on Windows. On Windows, you need to use the PyExe. For this kind of uh, interpreter discovery, there are two paths which basically detail how Python discovery should work on different platforms, basically like a Unix and Windows. And uh, the tool follows basically those two ideologies. And we use virtual and to create virtual environments for the given version. And then at the end of it, there is an install dependencies, meaning that you basically with just whatever you specify. You can specify explicitly the dependency. One of the things we install the dependency that you specify here. This supports whatever PEP 440 supports, meaning that you can also specify like requirements to XTF file. They basically just get forwarded to your installer, which by default is PIP, but for example, someone can use PIPEMF or whatever other they might want to use. And then there are also other dependencies. After we install the project dependencies, or the, the ones that specified for the tool, then there's another set of dependencies, the project itself. And this also means everything specified inside the install requires will also be installed in the second phase. OK? Now there is a slight, uh, yeah, the default is LP, but can be changed via tools. OK. So once you installed the, your project, you have it available in a fresh environment, just as it would be installed basically at the user end, if they would use it. You then, the following thing is to actually run your comments. Okay? So for this kind of comments, for example, here, we do three things, or three things. There are three comments to be run. The first comment is basically, let's just build the documentation. The second thing is basically, Let's see if all the links are valid inside the documentation. And then the final one is just prints out for the user where he can find the documentation and view it. OK? One of the important things that we do for running the comments is that we basically strip away most of your operating system environment variables. And this is quite uh, helpful in a lot of the cases, especially when you're relying on some environment variables or your project has some environment variables, which drives its functionality. It is often the case that you set it locally, but then forget it that on the other user's machine that not may be set. So this ensures that you can already fail on this kind of mm, environments not set case locally, and not have to actually wait until other users report it that, by the way, on my system, that doesn't work. OK? And basically, the chain of comments, we run it one after another. And whenever one fails, we stop. 
And if any of the comments fail, that the environment is marked as being a failure. Okay. And uh, we stream basically whatever your tool puts out on the output. This can be configured basically, but by default we stream out. This allows you to actually see what the tool output was, so you can then take it take uh, action based on that. Okay. So, and the final thing is we just print a nice report. For example, in this case, you can see that two environments failed, basically the test and the linting, but the documentation generation finished with success. Okay. So basically, this is like the workflow of Tux. This is what it does you. It basically ensures you that you have a virtual environment which is as specified inside your configuration. It automatically sets it up. It will package your project. It will, in the end, allow you to actually print out whatever happened when you run it. The idea is that, for example, if some new user joins the project, they don't have to say, like, so how do I run the test? Basically, they can just invoke Tux, and that will print out, and that will do everything for them, and basically have a local CI if they need it. OK, let's see some use cases or how actually it works in practice. Okay. So for example, this is a default end call. You can see that this actual call might take some time, because this is creating it on a fresh state. You can see that we have three targets. We have basically the same, the testing, the linting, and the documentation phase. And we will start creating these phases one by one once we just invoke the talks. And it will invoke Pythos with the correct arguments. It will ensure that the environment has been created. And whenever any error happens, we immediately display it for the users so they can act on it. OK? Now, the thing is, this usually takes a lot faster. The reason why it, now it is a bit slower is because basically we have create operations there and creating a virtual environment and installing dependencies because network is involved and I is involved is not as fast as many of the things. So at first time it could take longer, but for example, in a, when you invoke it the second time, then basically we don't have to do anything then just re-invoke the comments that you have because all the dependencies are already installed and are in place. Okay? So it is obviously possible that you can run also just subset of environments. For example, the case is you might only want to test what actually modifies the source code. For example, documentation generation, you don't really care what you're actually developing. Or for example, another popular use case of this is that you want to run your, if you have, for example, testing against two Python environment, and you want to ensure that, for example, you run the test for Python 2.7 and 3.6, and then you want to have another step after it, which basically calculates the aggregated coverage report that you can do via this kind of way, because you can specify that run these two Python environments and then display an aggregated, an aggregated uh, coverage for those two. OK? OK, another thing that is quite nice is that you can actually document whatever the targets are so the users don't have to actually guess. So you can add descriptions to it and then the user when, for example, this is for our own Tuxini file, basically when someone says, okay, what can I do with this project? They can just list whatever the possible targets are and they can read if they want to run any of them or not. Okay? You can see that there are the default environments which are always run and then additional ones which are on demand, basically. Another option is that you we support the pause arcs, I'm sure. So basically, if you testify for your comment that you want to pause arc and end, this means that if you use the double dash, and after double dash, you can basically forward arguments to your underlying tool. This is very helpful. For example, in this case, I wanted to run the test until Python 2.7, and if anything fails, I wanted to enter into the debugging, for example, PDB. Okay, so I did not. I, I could basically just pass them on to the invocation after the double dash as additional arguments, and they automatically get forwarded. This is also a nice way. For example, you can have more verbose test reports and all those kind of things, which are basically more like you want to understand more deeply what something broke, and not just run the default test with so to say. Okay. Another option which we have there is basically we have another a project which is like detox. This basically allows to run things in parallel. For example, it is possible to run all the environments in parallel and then display an aggregated output. Now obviously the limitation of this is that we can no longer stream the output in real time. Because if you would do basically you would mean that five environment five tools run in parallel and all five tools would 
print a character on the screen, it would be quite hard to actually see what's on the output. Okay. So uh, another quite thing, you can actually create a developer environment. Uh, when I say developer environment, and this is especially true for libraries, it means that we don't actually install your package as the user would install it, but we install your package using pip as in developer mode, which basically means that pip will not actually install your package by putting it in the side package, but creates a sim link and says that the source code lives in your wherever you're developing, and then the whenever Python is running, it will actually pick up your local files and not the remote, uh, not the site package files. Okay? Uh, okay. Now, just one thing, uh, once you start creating this kind of environment, or general, it is quite healthy, for example, in your environment, you can quickly select one of the environments to be the one for developer ecosystem to use. For example, in this case, for PyCharm, there is this PyMV managed plugin, which is quite nice, which allows you to basically just right click on any of the environments, B may talk for any other virtual environment and say, Biden now change the interpreter package to this Python which is inside this, in this folder. Okay. So another thing which is quite popular is like obviously, especially like big projects care about four or five Python versions. You might not have all the Python versions locally on your machine, so it doesn't make sense to force failing those environments which you don't have Pythons. You can specify that only run environments which, for which we can actually find the correct Python version. For example, don't try to run Python 3.5 if that's not on the system, because it will fail, but it's not actually a failure that the test failed, it's just that we could not, we have dependently missing for it, okay? Another helpful thing is this, and this is especially helpful for like uh, bigger projects like, or like the Django project, is that Django projects historically have like a lot of versions and you want to ch check a lot of combinations and ensure that all the combinations actually work. It allows you to basically specify, and as you can see in three lines, all of that kind of Django combinations. And there, for example, you can see that for example, the Django master actually you can specify even like GitHub links and it will install the latest from GitHub and try to test it against that. Okay? So as you can see basically with just 10 lines of configuration, now you can test against like 12 combination of dependencies that your users might run into. Okay? Now obviously you might not necessarily want to run all of this locally when you develop but this can work something in the CI, and whenever something breaks in the CI, you locally you don't have to manually recreate the environment. You can just say, by the way, on the CI, I saw that the Pi 37 Django master failed. Let me just recreate that and run the test only in that and try to debug what actually is the underlying issue for that. Okay? So, CI integration. As I said, the whole concept of it is that we would prefer to not be to be CI agnostic, meaning that we want the CI to basically don't have to actually specify all this. The CI should basically just invoke the same thing as the user would locally basically just invoke tux. And this means that your CI configuration, if you use tux, besides the user actually having the option to easily set up locally any kind of environment, now the CI, you don't have to use the property CI environment, but you can basically just say that, oh, by the way, make sure that I have these pythons in that in that uh, CI, and then finally install them with, uh, install, for example, my tux, and then just run tux, and that's the entire CI configuration. Okay? So, let me sum up a bit what I tried to present here today and what we learned. So, the first thing is, obviously, there are weaknesses of the tools. Uh, the biggest weaknesses, or what people often get confused, is that dependency updates. The way pip works, if you say to pip that install pip 11, and unless you specify that, by the way, please make sure that you upgrade if you have any things, the package is not there, pip will actually not install it. It will say, I have pip. It doesn't even check what version it is. It says, I have my version. PIP is already there. I do not actually evaluate that you wanted PIP 11. So that if I, you need to specify the dash capital U, 
which basically means upgrade, and then it will force make sure that it upgrades whenever it installs that PIP version. Another thing which is, which, but this is not the true, for example, dependencies. For example, if you install a library and the library's dependency is already there, PIP will not actually upgrade it. And because we use PIP, we have this kind of uh, mistake on our side, or like this kind of uh, vulnerability on our side, which bottom line boils down to that whenever you add new dependencies to your project, Tux will not actually upgrade your, or pull in your new version of the dependency. It will add new dependencies, but will not actually, if you just bump the version requirement, it will not actually ensure that the bigger version is installed. Okay? So the workaround for now is actually just force the recreating the environment. You can pass in the dash R flag, and that basically means, by the way, you recreate the environment from scratch, and that ensures it. The medium plan goal for that is that once PIP will actually support uh, installing uh, or like having uh, dependency graphs and evaluating that kind of things, this should be also solvable. Okay, uh, another thing is that the build dependency I said beforehand, this probably should have some solution in the next few months. And, but let's see what strengths we have. So what we can use, basically, you can make, make sure that you can add new tools to your project and to do, users can run those projects locally without actually needing to teach them the new tools. Only if they actually want to run those, to, or like they actually want to debug those new tools, then they have to learn about it. It allows you to run your test suite under multiple Python versions without uh, having to manually create all the virtual environments for all the Python versions. Plus, it allows you to run locally exactly what you would run on the CI. Okay, so this means that if, and as I said before, like if anything breaks on the CI, it's easy to reproduce it locally. And finally, it is just a Python package, meaning it runs on any environment, so wherever your contributor or user may be, it's easy for them to get on board, because now they, for example, compared to Make, they don't have to install something which only works on Unix system, okay? And it has a, hopefully, a readable configuration instead of some ugly, Early configuration. Okay. So uh, finally, one thing which we have, like similar as PyTest has, we also have a plugin system. So if you want to do anything which doesn't work out of boxing box talks, you can do it by having a plugin. For example, you can see that there are plugins out there and quite popular which basically swap out the Python setup Python, for example, to using CMake to building the project, or use the ru you running Docker as a to as an environment where you can have virtual environments. So Docker is also kind of like a virtual environment. So it's easily to plug in those kind of things. But there are a lot of other things. For example, there's also in development a package which should allow you to use Conda if you are more like a Conda developer and use the environments from there. Okay, thank you very much, and now I'll take your questions. Thank you for the talk. We have about 15 minutes time for questions. Who has questions about talks? Uh, what tools, uh, do you have any thoughts about SQL integration or integration with databases? Um, or is it just a purely Python specific thing? Can you just write your own tool to go off and populate your Postgres database with um, test data, et cetera? And how, how, how do you extend it, I guess, is the question, is the broad question. Depends on what you're using. I would say probably this is what you're speaking about is basically, I suppose, database dependencies. Uh, I would say probably what you're looking for is you can set, create different kind of uh, fixtures which set up different kind of databases. And then you can specify, for example, that different environments generated use different kind of fixtures which set up the database. And that could, I think, fairly reasonably work. And you can do like that, for example, if you want to test both with Oracle and MySQL, that would make it possible. Uh, I'm not sure that you, you could probably also do it without having the toxin direction. You could probably also just have parameterized threads in PyTest. Depends, I think it's personal preference which you prefer. 
Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, would you know if uh, during the environment creation stage, um, would you be able to specify a requirements.txt file or something like that? Yeah, as I said, like in the dependencies, you can actually specify both a requirements.txt or a constraint.txt, which is another thing which we introduced. As opposed to what's in setup.py. Sorry? As opposed to what's in the, what's uh, specified in setup.py. So setup.py is only required if you have a library. Uh, usually for libraries, I think the best practice is to use setup.py to de specify the dependencies. Uh, requirements takes is more popular for applications, like the requirements takes were developed for applications. Mm -hmm. If you have an application, then you don't have a build process. You only have the, dependent, the environment creation. In that case, you can specify the requirements takes easily. Just pass it on as instead of dependently. I think, it, I think at one point you mentioned running uh, things in parallel. Uh, doing multiple environments yes. at once. I don't remember seeing Tox do that before. How do you? It's uh, okay. as a, so at the moment it's not built in, meaning that you need to run Detox, which is also lives under the Tox organization. But it basically is just a driver which allows you to run multiple Tox environments in parallel. It's a higher abstraction. So yeah, it's not built in. But if you look up Detox, it should be what you want. Will Detox go as far as running a couple projects in parallel, or is it still strictly one project at a time? It is one project at a time, mostly because your different projects might have different uh, configurations. Uh, that being said, there is no real reason why we could not like have parallel configuration parsing and running. Uh, I don't think anyone actually raised the need for that. You know, so strongly that they actually wanted to develop it. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, just a question you mentioned you can make a variation on the Django uh, yeah. dependency in your project there. Um, in our case, we have dozens of dependencies and usually we ship with every dependency has been fixed to a specific version mm -hmm. and what is interesting is to see for many of those can we upgrade because they're fixed in time and we realize three months or six months later you know maybe we should upgrade to the latest and not be stuck in the past and we want to explore the, the versions we can now use how could we leverage that kind of tool to explore how we can upgrade our dependencies without breaking completely? Because sometimes they, you know, they collide and it doesn't work anymore. So, so that's in, in my view, that would be a, a, a requirement that is fixed to specific versions and one other requirements that would be you know, more flexible and say, okay, I just... Yeah, I mean, if you can see this example, for example, you can see that Django 1.8 is actually fixed to Django 1.8, but for example, the master is actually master. I could easily just specify Django latest, which would be like whatever, without any dependency specification, and then it will install the latest. So that's one. How, how would you cope with AT dependency? Oh, uh, I mean, Technically speaking, you could do it with similar like, like this kind of factor expressions that because we call them factor expression, they're at the top. They are put there even like the dependencies you can put it in. So it allows you to do even more deeper kind of this kind of specifications. But just a word of caution, if you have like 10 dependencies, you're talking about a factorial of 10. So I'm not sure you would actually run that in real time. And probably usually like in practice, what we saw is usually people want a few major things and maybe the latest. And then when that breaks, the, according to that, you may be altering your, like for example, specifying that, by the way, our package no longer works with, because it broke on the old, when I installed all the latest, it broke with this package's latest. So I'm just pinning that to a given version until someone takes up the task of fixing what, why it doesn't work now with the latest. Because otherwise you just have too many, the space is too big. And even if your tests run five seconds, you are already looking at like probably next year when one of the running finishes. Okay, any more questions? So we don't want to wait till next year. So we have break now and have lunch. Enjoy lunch and thank you very much. Thank you very much.